The 19th century saw such a large increase in the creation of women's clubs, it was known as the Progressive Era. Women's clubs began to focus on social and political reform. Black women's clubs also focused on issues such as anti-lynching and racial stereotypes. It was a time of massive oppressive oppression of black people. And while New Bedford is relatively um, free from some of the really harmful parts of discrimination that Southern people feel, there's still discrimination. There's still discrimination. About 1895, there is actually a, a man in Missouri. He is the head of the Missouri Press Association, um, James Knox, and he decides that he's going to write a letter condemning black women. He's going to write a letter because he wants people around the world to know how horrible colored women are. So you say, well, why did he want to do that? Um, he actually, uh, if I just read the quote, he actually wrote and said, most colored women in the United States were wholly devoid of morality and that they were prostitutes, liars, and thieves. So this is a person who is the head of the Missouri Press Association. He writes this letter and he sends it to England and he sends it to the anti-slavery groups in England because, you know, slavery is still going on. Brazil, for instance, has not let their slaves out in 1890. Um, he sends it to her because he wants this to spread around the country and around the world. And that's how really Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin puts out a call. And that's what they call it. You'll, you'll hear people say the call went out. But it's essentially a call to convention. It's a call for women of color in the region, and it wasn't just Massachusetts, but in the region, to come together and start to address some of these issues. And the issues were things like white women's organization shutting us out, this jocks writing his piece. The other thing is that Nationally, there's something called the Columbia Exposition, which comes out about 1890, but it, it's a way for the United States to organize and show what contributions they could make into the next century. So black women were trying to make sure that their voice was heard and their face was heard in the exposition, and the white women wouldn't have it. And the white men certainly wouldn't have it. So you have this whole, there are all these kind of um, forces coming together to talk about how people are going to move forward as a country and as a people into the 20th century. And here you have these black women really who are being dragged into the mud for things that they had no control over. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs was formed in 1896 to bring together black women from across the country. Many well-known women were members of the clubs. Among them were Mary Church Terrell and Elizabeth Carter Brooks. So by doing that, they decided to get all women's clubs to be able to go under this one umbrella to work toward bettering the lives of colored men, women, and children in the United States because there was lynchings going on at that time. There were some of the same things, redlining, lack of mortgages, not being able to get jobs, not being able to own homes. And the idea was to be able to do some advocacy behind that. That's why Martha Briggs was organized. Um, even with NACWC, women were not National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, they were not encouraged uh, to join white female organizations. 
The General Federation of Women's Clubs was formed as an umbrella organization for the many women's clubs around the world. However, they excluded African American women's clubs from membership. In 1900, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin of the Boston Women's Era Club and the NACWC was refused admission to GFWC's annual meeting out of the organization's concerns of upsetting some of its members. First of all, New Bedford always had an activist woman's organization. So many of the organizations that people belong to that were organized around the anti-slavery efforts, those things kept going just in different areas. They might have taken a different focus. But for African Americans, there was an uh, anti-slavery society. And for white women, there were clubs where women would pull together. They would save money, clothing, food, books, and they would send those things down south which is also how we come to hear about Martha Briggs. So you have women who understand that now that slavery has ended in the South, who is going to help the enslaved individuals learn? Who's going to help them read when it was against the law for them to read before? Everyone knows, you, you know, the separate but equal what separate but equal means is there's no equality and they're separate and maybe they'll get a book and maybe they won't. Um, but there weren't, uh, there was no real push for public education and in the South people really didn't want to educate black people. It's really northerners in the north, many of whom were women, who go down because of the Freedmen's Bureau. So, you know, right after the Civil War, 1865, 1868, people are going south, and women in New Bedford are in the forefront. First of all, New Bedford sends contingents of women to teach, but New Bedford women, who are fairly wealthy women, send goods. They send food, they send books, they send clothing. Um, they support Harriet Jacobs, who uh, was related um, to the Grinnell family here in New Bedford by uh, actually working for them. They sent things to Martha Briggs School. They sent things down because that was, that was what purposeful women did. And they called themselves purposeful women women who had a purpose in life other than just raising their children, they wanted a better world. The Martha Briggs Educational Club was founded by women of color in 1920 to do colored welfare work and to promote educational opportunities for girls and boys of color. Called together by Mrs. Jenny Wilder Lee, the club's first president, the women met weekly and provided a time and a place for women of color to gather. I would say that they were probably one of the major African American organizations in the city of New Bedford because other than them all there was was the Masons, the Elks, the Susan, Salvo, Temple. They, the NAACP existed because that was formed in New Bedford in 1917 so they were just one of a few and uh, at that time they didn't own this house so they used to hold meetings in people's homes and they would meet during the week on in the evening, which I find interesting because that means they were all getting together like after they took care of their kids and family and then came out and met. The club was named in honor of Martha Briggs, a woman who made significant contributions to the education of children of color. The women of color back in the in 1920 wanted to name the club for someone that they emulated, that they wanted to emulate her style, her, her vision, her, her goals to become a teacher, to become uh, a woman uh, that sacrificed a lot and did a lot for her community. She was the daughter of a journeyman and he encouraged her to not only get her education, but she would teach 
people who were new to the area freed people to read and write. She went to New Bedford High at the age of 13 because her father was taken in by uh, George Howland. Her father, John Briggs, was the, uh, was the age, same age as John, George Howland's oldest son. And they became friends and they grew up together. Uh, John Briggs worked for George Holland. And so we feel that Martha Briggs got into New Bedford High because of, of George Holland, who was a Quaker, a Quaker in the city of New Bedford. And when she graduated, she taught um, in Martha's Vineyard, and she taught George Downing's children in Rhode Island. George Downing was a restaurateur. He was a man of color and he established a school for his children because he didn't want his children to feel the sting of slavery by going to an all-black school. So he established the school in, his, in Newport, Rhode Island. She wanted to travel south to teach more and at that time it was not considered appropriate for a young woman to do so. Um, eventually she was allowed to go to DC and she, Washington DC and she taught in the school system there. She eventually went on to become an educator at the Minor Normal School which became the educational department of what is now Howard University. That normal school subsequently, uh, I believe, separated from Howard and is now part of the University of the District of Columbia. But at the time of her death, she um, was recognized as having made such a contribution to the school that there was a whole um, entourage that accompanied her body back to New Bedford and she was buried in rural cemetery here in New Bedford. So the structure of Martha Briggs Educational Club is there are officers, there currently there's president, vice president, treasurer, assistant treasurer, corresponding secretary and recording secretary. And that's pretty much been the same, except I think they had a second vice president. And um, they also had an executive committee, which included two other members. We don't really use the executive committee structure too much anymore. It were met weeknights for mm, all of my early life. Um, I sort of remember it a lot because my aunt was the secretary for years and years and she um, worked at the Newport Naval Station. She'd drive home from Newport, have something quick to eat and go to Martha Briggs meeting. And um, she did that for, I don't know how long, she was secretary forever. They did a lot of activities. They had a, pot, a lot of potlucks. They had uh, Whist games, they play cards, whist games. They used to also do, there was a, a New England African-American theater group called the Skitamert Group. It just means dramatics backwards. So they actually hired them to put on some plays. And we have a, a playbill from that, from 1950s when they put on a play with the Skitamert Group. They also had the Lenten Teas, which we still hold today, right this year as of 2019 and for the last I don't know how many years, the Lenten teas have always been held on Palm Sunday, just, and we just have one, but in the 1940s they used to have three. I mean, when they started having the Lenten teas, they had six, and then they cut it down to three, and I haven't gotten to the point where they've stopped having three Lenten teas, but that was a big highlight of the year. And, and uh, the amount of money that they raised for, for all these activities, it wasn't a lot, but it did help keep the house running. It, the dues were, were incredible. Like in the 1950s, they were still paying like 50 cents a meeting. <laughs> it's like
<laughs> kind of crazy to think that somebody is, is uh, doing that because currently our dues are $150 for a year. For many years, Martha Briggs, in addition to awarding scholarships, held a, a dance for graduating high school seniors. And it was held in the ballroom of the old New Bedford Hotel. And all of the students of color who graduated in New Bedford were invited to attend. And it was meaningful because not a lot of the students of color attended the proms that were held in the schools. In large part because there weren't a whole lot of students of color and in some measure because there was not a level of comfort in attending such things. Mary Barrows, the city councilor, was always supportive of Martha Briggs because when she graduated from high school, which had to have been probably the late 40s, she was invited to attend the Martha Briggs graduates dance. And she said it was so meaningful for her because she didn't go to the prom and there was nothing else done to celebrate the achievement of um, students of color. In 1939, the club purchased the Sergeant William Carney House on Mill Street in New Bedford. So Martha Briggs Educational Club acquired this house from Elizabeth Carter Brooks in 1939. And Elizabeth Carter Brooks had um, received the house from Clara Carney. Clara Heronia Carney was the daughter of Susanna and uh, Sergeant Carney. And she was a violin teacher. And she lived in that house until she died. Clara Carney was the daughter of Sergeant William H. Carney, the first African-American Medal of Honor recipient. He earned his medal during the Fort Wagner uh, event in South Carolina in 1863, but he didn't receive his medal until 1900. And he earned it for actions of bravery at Fort Wagner. He did, I don't know if he had his house built or if he bought it already made, but the house is, is supposed to be from, it, the house is circa 1870. And he lived here until he died in 1908. Once he died, it, it passed to his wife, Susanna. And when she died, then it passed to Clara. And Clara had mortgaged it off. And somehow, Elizabeth Carter Brooks wound up with the house in 19. I'm not sure when she got the house, after Clara died, probably. And um, Martha Briggs Educational Club bought it from Elizabeth Carter Brooks in 1939 for, I think, $3,500. So they had, they had to pay off that mortgage, and then they you know, had to do some work there. And at one point in the 50s, it was the West End Day Nursery. So they actually rented space before they owned their property on Cedar Street. Built in 1856, the Carney House remained the club's headquarters. It was, it's been restored a couple of times in, 1970s, in the 1970s or 80s, one of the two. The club received a Massachusetts Historical Commission grant and they did work on the outside of the house, but at some point some work was done on the inside because it does have more period appropriate wallpaper and colors and probably the light fixtures are from the time, maybe, but they may be they might be from the time, but they might be replacements, because I have no idea what it looked like when it was a daycare center. The club continues to be very active. In addition to awarding scholarships, the Martha Briggs Educational Club continues to offer educational and cultural events in the Carney House to help finance its mission. Among the most successful events is a traditional Lenten tea, which continues today. A lot of the club membership early on would be 
one or two generations or more of the same family. Um, and in addition to the, the efforts to stimulate scholarship aid, there was, as I said, the social activities. But the big social thing was the Lenten tea. The, for many years now, Lenten teas have been held only on Palm Sunday. But in the earlier part of my life, and I guess the earlier part of the club's life, there would be a Lenten tea every Sunday of Lent. So there would be four teas. And the big um, source of pride was to have your baked goods included in the refreshments for the tea. Um, there was one woman who was famous for her particular chocolate cake. There was another woman who was famous for making tea sandwiches with colored bread. Um, these, everything was homemade. And it is, the tradition has been carried on. The Lenten tea has long um, grown in size so that it, ex it exceeds the space capacity of the club room. So it's for many years now been held at the um, First Unitarian Church. Now they're a, a fundraiser, but it's interesting because the attendance at the teas has increased greatly because the tradition is one of the few places where it's um, maintained and honored as much as it has been in the past. For instance, the tea and coffee are served in silver services and served in real cups as opposed to plastic or paper. And because my sister is somewhat of a fanatic about such things, we have real tablecloths with cloth tablecloths everywhere. Um, on the table from which the coffee and tea is served, there is a colored cloth liner, but the overlaying um, tablecloth is a hand crocheted tablecloth that was made by Marie Miller, who was a club member. Marie Miller was the sister of Charles' daddy, Grace. And while she was a member, she crocheted the tablecloth. So it's been used, I would guess, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 years, the tablecloth is used. I think it's only used one time a year. No, I think teas we used to be the thing back in the day, and we're we're keeping it going, you know, because it's uh, uh, it's something that Martha Briggs always did. So we continue with our teas. Um, we continue with our scholarship events. They've changed. Um, before we used to have um, uh, people that we would honor at. Uh, places like Century House, or we'd have the Botillions and the Cotillions. But today, we're having painting parties, and they're fun. They're lots of fun. They're well attended. We have them at Gallery X. Um, we had one not too long ago. It was our fourth painting party, and uh, the, the, the painting comes out very well, very well. Um, she might, the, the painter may say, you know, in the middle of the, uh, of the canvas, make this mark, or one thumb in, make this mark, you know, halfway down, and 
we get the picture, you know, that she is, she has created ahead of time, and she creates one with us at that, at that time. Unfortunately, club activity has diminished everywhere, across the country, everywhere. And when I joined in 1987, there were, I believe there were six clubs in Boston, one in Springfield, and one in New Bedford. All of the others in Massachusetts have dissolved. So Martha Briggs is the only one of the clubs still in existence in Massachusetts. I hope Martha Briggs is, is, continues to grow and, and uh, it, for the next hundred years. Um, our house is paid for. We have one uh, tenant who occupies the second floor. Our club rooms are on the first floor. Um, we uh, hope that uh, we continue uh, giving out scholarships to worthy children of color um, and uh, through our efforts as, as members. In 1920, the Martha Briggs Educational Club responded to the call originally issued by Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. Now, over 100 years later, they continue to fight discrimination and promote the education and well-being of worthy girls and boys. Because after all, that is what purposeful women 